Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor. Thank you for listening wherever you found po- this podcast or this show. Um, we are definitely going to dive into the Miami Heat's uh, pretty big victory in Utah uh, in the midst of what has been a uh, unpleasant road trip. But before we do, I want to tell you about one of the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network and a Five on the Floor in particular, and that's Therapist Preferred. So Therapist Preferred is a CBD company that was founded in 2019 by a physical therapist. Um, They maximize performance uh, with recovery for active people with all of these 100% THC free third party lab verified products. All products made in the USA, cutting edge technology, organically grown hemp. Uh, The most popular ones, some of my favorites, the CBD sports cream, strawberry lemonade gummies, the green apple gummies. You can find the links all on the website. That's therapistpreferred.com. When you go to that website, use promo code 5RSN. Get it? Five reasons. 5RSN for 25% off your order plus free shipping on all orders. Again, shop now at therapistpreferred.com and follow them on social media. They are on Twitter. Give them a shout out at Therapist Preferred. And uh, now today's episode. Yay. Uh, five on the floor, ride for my dogs. Where here's the thing, you can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like Buck the said, you in trouble, y'all. Kept the floor playing, got an all band. Y'all seen the block, stop in one hand. And Pat, we trust, it's power, have the guts. We here to bring the heat, y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. Welcome back to Five on the Floor. I'm your host, Greg Sylvander. With me to break down the Miami Heat uh, unlikely victory, I'll say the most unlikely victory of the season is Alex Toledo and Brady Hawk. Ethan Skolnick is... um, still doing the West coast thing and uh, is out of pocket. So we shall uh, keep this moving. So guys, this was something that I don't think any of us expected. Brady and I were on the pregame show. We both were, uh, I I think like there was a part of us that, that saw a path to this being able to happen, but you don't necessarily want to come out and say that it actually can take place. Right. So My initial takeaway was like, boy, did they need this right now? I tweeted it mid game. Like they needed this win so much. I feel like just collectively as a group, mentally, emotionally, there's a lot of things we're going to talk about from an individual perspective about guys that really needed um, this, this type of game. Brady, just initial key takeaways. I know you fire them up. They're probably already up on the website. Did you get your five takeaways already up? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, this is unbelievable. I didn't get a chance to check those out yet because I, I was preparing for this with my own show sheet. So, Brady, tell us what your key takeaways are. Maybe not all five. Save some of them. Keep them in your bag of tricks. But uh, your biggest takeaways right off the off the cuff. Yeah, I think the first one, I know we're going to get into a lot of individual player stuff, so I don't want to go too deeply into that. But I think if I'm going through this starting lineup tonight, Tyler here would probably be the last guy I got to on that list. Like, I'd hit on Duncan, Bam, PJ, and Kyle, before I hit Larry, and you take a look at the box score and you see 27 points. My initial takeaway is that although he'd be my last guy I went to, I think we're seeing a guy that this is just normal now. Like this is literally what he's going to do on a regular basis. Maybe not score 27 on a regular basis, but he's just going to score in a way that you kind of don't realize that he has that many points. You look at a box score, one for seven from three, and he's still able to get that many points just because of the drop coverage. He was able to get to the rim get to the mid range and it's like showing a complete player that we talk about three level score maybe, and he's doing it. So I think that was one of the major things. I think from a team perspective, shooting 39% from three, close to 40%. That's different. Like, I think most of these post game pods we've done, I'd sit here and saying 23 to 24% from three every night. Like that's not my meat basketball, even though it may be this season, last season, it was not, that was kind of their specialty. Uh, and a big reason for that, is Duncan Robinson, which I'm sure we'll get into now in a second. But it just feels like overall three-point shooting, be able to be there when you don't have Jimmy Butler and you don't have that rim pressure and you're able to create good looks and actually hit them, like that's just big time. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything you said wholeheartedly. And to see Duncan get back on track is awesome. And we're going to talk about that because uh, it's been such a hot topic that the fact that he 
shot as well as he did. We're going to take some time there. But before we get into that part of it, uh, you th- y'all thought I was about to read some ad read. No, 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 no. Um, I want to talk to Alex about the way that game ended. Like, so the game was great. First half up 10, they extended the lead. I think they got it up to 17 at, some, at one point. I don't know how high it got. I mean, weren't they up 25 at one point? Like, I and think they said 30. They got it to 30. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure I heard him say that at one point in the fourth quarter, that that was the, that that was as high as the lead got at one point. That wasn't where they came back from. Got it. So should we be concerned? Like, we're not going to spend a lot of time here because no podcast hosted by me is going to um, focus on the negative when you beat Utah in Utah without Jimmy Butler. So we're spending like five seconds here, but because uh, the X's and O's and the way that the basketball games go, and I know that it's a game of runs, but like, did you see anything at the end of that game that concerns you that could carry over just anything like that? I'm, I'm just, before we put to bed the Utah jazz game and the way that it ended specifically, um, just, I, I'd like you to dive in on that. I actually didn't see anything that particularly bothered me to, at the end of the game. If that's what we're going to talk about here specifically, like, I think it was a lot of complacency and I know it's kind of a cop-out answer. And it's also a little bit obvious because there's no way you give up that much of a run without a little bit of complacency. Right. And I just think it's, you know, you, you go up so much. I, I think a part of you, uh, I, however quantifiable, quantifiable or unquantifiable that is like a, a part of you just kind of it isn't as hungry or isn't doesn't try with the same exact degree. And I think that's something that a lot of people can, can relate to anybody that's, you know, played sports before, whether competitively or not. Right. And I just think they they got complacent versus a team that is one of the best in the league, especially during the regular season, has been really good, is playing at home with all their guys and just kind of saw all the heats, different defenses thrown uh, throughout that game because we saw zones. We saw. Uh, traps and, and, and stuff like that. I, I feel like we saw the heat switching obviously a lot. That was, that was the, the huge thing for me. And it was, there's some nights where it's, I, I'm very, you know, concerned about it and other, other nights where it looks great. And I think the switching was actually really good tonight. You held like their best scores and shooters to pretty low percentages for what they're used to. And then you win on a night like that with so much emphasis before that comeback without a big BAM game. Like he ends up four of 11 from, from a scoring wise. And I think you would expect BAM to have a bigger game for them to, you know, beat up on the jazz like that in Utah without Jimmy. And obviously BAM played well in other aspects, but I just think like the biggest takeaway for me uh, outside of the crunch time is that the heat are drop killers, man. And it, it's not that simple, right? I think we've seen them struggle against switching defenses, but that drop, like Kyle looks comfy, Tyler looks comfy. And Duncan looks comfy, especially, I mean, uh, uh, definitely against Gobert, but especially against Hassan Whiteside. Oh, my and gosh, so, yes. Yeah, those. that's the main stuff I took away from this game. Um, a couple of things I want to uh, wanna touch on there before we go to um, what Brady already alluded to, because we're going to spend some time on Duncan. But uh, something that jumped off the page for me here is that, you know, I, I generally have the guts and I, I, I generally don't pick against the heat, but this game of all games was one where I just did not think they were going to get it. So for them to come out and play the way that they did, uh, I may have opened the podcast that way. I'm reiterating it again. This was huge for them. The timing of this, uh, what had been swirling around this team, there had been skirmishes in multiple games. You can see from some frustration and that kind of stuff to get this kind of victory is huge. Um, and it was n- bigger for nobody than it was for Duncan Robinson. What did he finish? Six of 11 from three. So that's hovering in the mid 50, 54%. I'm doing that off the top of the dome and I'm not bragging because that's not my skill set. Um, Brady. So we've been on the pregame show over and over again. We're like, here comes the Duncan Robinson game. Here comes the Duncan Robinson game. And and I don't even know that we should really pin this as the Duncan Robinson game, but it is a slump buster type of game. Uh, did you see anything different from him? Or is this just literally like, like as simpleton as the shots went in? Yeah, I think it, it was just the shots were falling. Like, it, if he gets one early on, like, it, it was kind of a discussion last season. When he got two early on, like, you were like, oh, this is one of those Duncan games that we see so often. And it was kind of like remembrance of that when you kind of just saw him getting to that early. I just think it's interesting of the way 
uh, he was doing the same things he's done all season. Like it was nothing new, but the interesting thing is we've talked about maybe reverting back a little bit to some of the things he used to do. And one of the things he did better than anybody was have a two man game with Bam out of bio. Uh, it wasn't in the same way tonight. Like it wasn't just running handoffs, but I will say, you know, we'll touch on Bam, but I think it was probably his, by far his best passing game of the season. Uh, and most of that was finding Duncan Robinson. Like no matter if it was on backdoor cuts, if it was finding him in the corner when they would try to, you know, double away from him. Like, they had a type of connection where it felt like Bam was almost saying to himself, like, we only way we're going to win this game without Jimmy Butler is if Duncan Robinson hits threes. And that's what it kind of felt like. And he hit them. Um, and I think something interesting is we talked about him, you know, we kind of expected him to grow into more of a, a two point guy, like maybe get to the rim, maybe get to the mid range and do different things. He can't do that if he's not hitting threes. Like it's that simple. The way you get to the two, if you're Duncan Robinson, so if you're hitting threes, guys fly out at you, you get by them, you get to the rim. Uh, you pull up in the mid range tonight. We saw that a little bit. Like we saw a couple lanes there. Like that stuff is important. Like all he has to do is hit some threes and everything changes for this offense. Like not only for him getting to the rim, but it's changes everything for defensive rotations. Uh, so it's just interesting. It's interesting. Just, I think that he needed two games. Like, I don't want to say this one game changes everything. I said two games in a row. And I think he's back. Like if he gets a rhythm, he gets a confidence that he had two games in a row and he's like, okay, now I'm back. I think that's when it clicks. So if he can come out, you know, we'll look forward probably later in the episode, but if he can come back in a game against OKC and have a big night or a decent night, just at least efficient night, then I think he's officially just back to normal. So you're more mature than me because I'm like, Duncan is back. He, he, he's shutting everybody up. Cause I, I really want him to start shooting well because to that point and, uh, and we're going to pivot here, but I just want to end by saying when Duncan shoots like that, you can actually survive nights without Jimmy. You could survive a, a night without Bam. Like what it opens up and what it allows other guys to be able to do, you just can't quantify it enough. So it, it was really good to see him get back on track. Let's hope it continues. We got a lot of other guys that we need to talk about, though, because you don't win at Utah after they just lost to Indy at home. This is now two home losses in a row for Utah. That doesn't happen often. Um, you don't do that unless it's a, a multiplayer effort. So we're going to talk about a few other guys, but before we do, I want to tell you about another great sponsor of five on the floor and five reasons sports network. And that's CPT of South Florida. Uh, they provided small, medium businesses with the technology they need for decades. They specialize in cloud hosted phone systems and managed IT. If you own a small or medium business and you're looking to save money on your monthly phone and internet costs, you should give TJ a call right now. He's been helping South Florida businesses save thousands per month, and he can do the same for you. With a cloud phone system, you can work from anywhere on any device. For a free in-person consultation, call TJ at 954-966-2766. That's 954-966-2766. If you call now, there's a promotion that includes 25% off cloud phone service, including free phones and the first two months service free. Deal with an owner, not a sales rep. Give TJ, so remember that name, y'all. TJ at CPT of South Florida. Call at 954-266-2766 or visit his website at cpt-florida.com. All right, so a um, couple different places we can go here, but like straight up, Kyle and Tyler kind of undressed Mike Conley and Donovan Mitchell, right? Am I being too bullish there? Alex, I guess I'll start with you. Like, uh, first off, Tyler Hero is on another planet with the way he's playing right now. Like, who does he look like? Does he look like Ray Allen? Does he look like Allen Houston? Like, I'm trying to find the comp. Is he Dale Ellis? Like, I, I can't figure it out. But whatever the hell he's doing, he is unbelievable. I'm calling out names Brady to probably doesn't know of. I apologize for that. Not because he doesn't know basketball, but because they're old. <laughs> um, like, so Conley was awful. Um, as my son calls uh, things now he literal dog water is what he's been saying lately. Oh I don't know where God. that came from um, that's the thing that's the thing with little kids I'm telling you yeah like he's 10 so that's it, like I think it's a called. gaming thing yeah that's where I think he got it from I think, um, you, I think it's a Knicks nickname interesting yeah he plays arc a lot see now look I'm veering off in another direction so I, anyway back to this um talk about like Conley looked awful but like just the the ability for Tyler and Kyle to stem the tide and allow them to sit Jimmy and get this victory, just what it looked like. And, um, and just 
overall your, your, your key takeaways with the fact that Tyler is not slowing down. No, he definitely isn't. I, I've been believed that the leap is real. I was, to be honest, believing in the preseason, but obviously now with a few weeks under the belt, it's, it's a lot easier to believe he's just that guy right now. I'm not saying he's the best player on the team anything like that he's just a really damn good player he's probably still the fourth best guy on the team that doesn't even matter he's just a like I said a really good player and I don't think it's going to slow down especially when he's playing with the starters there's so much talent around him to make his job easier even though he does play with those guys uh pretty often in those bench units I, I just think it makes his job even easier because he can go against starting units I don't think he's one of those guys that you put in as a six man because he can't go up against starters I think if anything the only concern with him would be the defense when, when it comes to being in starting lineups, but not being able to get to his spots. He can just do it against anybody, clearly. And especially, like I mentioned before, against drop defenses, he just – he knows where those shots are going to be. I know I've mentioned this time and time again on this pod, but, like – and the Jazz, uh, you know, will switch some things here and there on the perimeter, but Gobert and Whiteside are always going to be dropping back. And so it's just so much easier for Lowry, Duncan, and Tyler, their, their main jump shooters – who all get to their shots in different ways to get to those shots regardless. And I think we saw an aggressive Kyle at times tonight after we saw it in that fourth quarter, almost come back against the Clippers that he could turn it on when he wants to, especially against slower bigs. I think he, he feasts on those guys. And look, man, this is why I feel good about this team in general, because I believe in the steps slash leaps, however you want to call it, that Bam and Tyler have taken, right? So I, I, that's overall why I'm so positive about them. They completely outplayed Conley and Mitchell tonight. Like you said, Mitchell shot eight of 19. Conley shot two of seven. Meanwhile, on the other hand, you had uh, Tyler 10 of 23 and Kyle eight of 14. So not to delve too much into the numbers here, but they also had a, a better offensive rating in the half court than the Jazz did. And I th that's something that I'm always going to keep bringing up because I'm interested to see because we know that they've gotten more transition stuff this year. And that's what's kind of gotten their offensive rating so high along with the rebounds. But when their half court offense is better than the other team on the road without their best player, that's a great sign. Like the stuff is real. And so I think that this is, you know, a huge redemption win for the heat. Yeah. I think the other thing you touch on like the field goal numbers, the interesting thing is that you can look at Kyle and Tyler's three point numbers tonight, three for 13. And it didn't matter. Like they still had amazing, you know, offensive nights and they don't need the three to fall. And I think that's when you kind of really know that something's for real, that, Tyler doesn't have to rely on a three-point shot anymore. Like, he came in and he gets the, the J.J. Reddick comparisons and he gets the spot-up shooter comparisons. Like, that's not him. He can hit it, you know, occasionally. And if he can rely on that, that'll be important for, on a team with Jimmy Butler and so many initiators. But he's an on-ball guy now. Like, three-point shots falling doesn't really make a difference on his night. Uh, and you touched a lot on just kind of the way heroes going at dropped. And I think the interesting thing is Kyle really – can pick apart a defense in this way, even without Jimmy Butler. Like when he's the guy, solely the guy that has the ball in his hands and he can kind of pick apart a defense, it really is fun to watch. Like he can go uh, take Gobert in isolation like he did last time in against Utah back in, in Miami. Uh, when he gets to that pull-up in the mid-range, like that's his that's when he's at his best as a scorer, it feels like right Love now. It. Like he can get to the rim right now and it looks good. He can shoot the three and it looks good, but nothing looks better than when he's kind of just stopping and popping or he, he throws in a spin move and spins back for, you know, a nice mid-range jumper. Like, that stuff is just new to see. And I think another thing, looking at the numbers of Lowry and Hero, nine for nine from the free throw line. Like, if they can attack without Jimmy and you can get a decent amount of free throws at least, that's another thing. This team picks up. It's, it's kind of weird. Like, it, without Jimmy, they kind of pick up on the minor things he does, it feels like. Like, he's impactful because you know what he does on a regular basis with Jimmy Butler. But when he's not there, you notice – like the things that he does uh, a couple of those things, like the rim pressure we touched on Tyler and Kyle provided that tonight. The free throws, like I just mentioned, they provided that tonight. So it just seems like when they can have those type of nights where you can pick up for Jimmy, uh, not just scoring wise or defensively, but in the minor parts, it just feels like that's, that makes the bigger difference in these games. So I wanted to add one more thing here, by the way, as we, you know, kind of talk through this game, I'm looking at the numbers and obviously without Jimmy, you're going to miss a lot of free throws, but you know, they lost that battle. They actually, uh, had more turnovers in the jazz as well. And still it was such a, you know, such an emphatic beat down before that comeback in the fourth quarter. And then re regarding like what we're already talking about there with the, these two back courts, I think a lot of that, what we, you know, what we saw the heat hold Donovan Mitchell, and Mike Conley, who had to do with the switching that we talked about earlier. Like they obviously had to see multiple bodies. Every time we saw PJ Tucker matched up on Donovan a lot, 
We obviously see a lot of BAM switching on to these guys as a result of their defense a lot of times. And I just think they never had easy looks. They made it really tough on them. And again, like, this is what you want to see, right? I just think they've got to be really selective with their switches and they've got to be on point when it comes to uh, rotating the small guys into the paint, which is really risky, right? And I just think, like, as long as those guys get to the spot, send help at the right time, the the big man, especially when it's somebody like Gobert who wasn't particularly skilled with the ball, like, that's – it's a it's a really viable uh, defensive scheme, and I think that's why Spo likes it because there's so much perimeter scoring talent in the league, and I think that's kind of what he's emphasizing is, like, keep those guys – um, from getting their looks, let other guys who aren't great shooters shoot threes and just make sure that nobody's getting easy stuff at the rim. And I think where it compromises is like, like I said before, if the smaller guys who are rotating weak sides of the rim are not there on time and then you're just seeing guys feasting like we saw with Zubac against the Clippers. So it, it's just hard because it reminds me of last season where it's like if that switching isn't on point, it can get ugly. So yeah. that's no. why I'm a little bit you know, concerned as far as using it game to game, but I I loved it for this matchup. I know. And the funny thing was like, I woke up this morning and said like, this isn't from the coaching staff's perspective. I didn't think this was, it was an X X and O's type of game. Like this was more of like, you got to motivate these guys and get them going. And then it turns out that like they flip the script and and throw these different defenses and layers of defenses. And they kind of like, I saw a couple times them look like they're going to get into a base defense and then completely switch up mid mid possession and stuff like that. So it's funny how the zone was in and out. Yeah, 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 for real. So um, it's funny how that creeps up. And but to the point of it being more than just about X's and O's, I want to talk about the rebounding because this was something that these are pretty evenly matched teams. But um, without without Jimmy. Um, you would think that that would become an issue and they out rebounded them by 10 PJ Tucker. So this is where we, we want to go. Like I wish he was signed to more than a one year deal because like, I want, uh, I want to buy all the PJ Tucker stock of him sticking around in Miami long-term. Like he's, he is the prototype Miami heat player. He has been rebounding just unbelievable on this trip. 13, 10 and 11 are his rebounding numbers. The last, three games Brady talk about PJ Tucker. He was three of three from three, which is huge. Plus 14 on the night. Uh, Got you three assists. So, I mean, he really had like a banner evening, but also the, the front court in general, you touched on bam earlier. And, uh, and I'd like to kind of wrap the two of those together in terms of how they anchored the front court. Yeah. From my perspective, like PJ Tucker was the heat's best player to them. Like I really believe that just seeing everything he did, talking about them filling the Jimmy Butler holes, the minor things he does. Initially, the first thing you saw tonight was P.J. Tucker crossing half court with the ball in his hands. Like, (laughs) I don't think I expected that coming into the game where he's the guy that's kind of initiating offense at times. Like, I don't think that's a role of his. Then he kind of transitioned into the mid mid to high post, like Jimmy inside the wing stuff, which was like kind of interesting as well. And he was playmaking out of it. Uh, And it kind of just leads into him kind of forcing kickouts and then he can kind of get position to make to the point of the rebounding, like 11 rebounds tonight. We talk about a lot of things PJ does, but like he does not, he's, what is he? Six, five, his ability to box out guys like Gobert is just insane. Like he just knows how to get positioned so well. Uh, and it's like, it feels like there should be more over the back calls when PJ Tucker's playing on the floor against guys like that. Cause it just seems like he knows how to get position better than anybody. Uh, and it was just a great night. You mentioned three for three from three, which is weird because I think two of those, we're from the wing or top of the key. Like, yeah, it's just, it was just an odd PJ Tucker night. Like this wasn't his usual role. This wasn't his three and D go guard the best player and go sit in the corner. This was kind of a Jimmy like game where he had to go do so many different things. And it's just interesting to see them have a guy like that, that just, he gets credit, but I don't think people understand the things he does on a nightly basis that you just, you don't realize. Like, (laughs) I think you take it for granted that if you didn't have PJ Tucker in the lineup, you'd miss a lot of these things and you'd probably get out rebounded and you'd probably get out hustled. And it just seems like there's all these things that every night he probably averages the most uh, times hitting the floor a night. Like it just, all these things adding up into the, into the equation. And you mentioned starting out the game defensively, he's on Donovan Mitchell and Donovan Mitchell had an off night. Like I don't want to sit here and say it was all Miami's defense because it wasn't, but a lot of that is PJ Tucker. Like PJ Tucker is everywhere. He knows when to double off a guy and he can kind of go for that, that reach that we knew from Iguodala, how he would always kind of never get that foul. He would just 
perfectly do it. I don't want to say he's on that level yet because that was a pretty elite skill from Iguodala, but it just seems like he knows when to go for that. And just so such a ball hawk that he just knows when to go for that. And it's just, I just believe that this was probably his best. He, the Heat's best player tonight was BJ Tucker. Yeah, newsflash Heat fans. Like, if you get down on a player when they go through a shooting slump, I'm going to prepare you now. No matter what P.J. Tucker does from a shooting perspective offensively, that dude's going to play for Eric Spolstra. And when it comes to playoff time and trusting a guy to not make mistakes, not foul, not foul in um, high leverage situations and make decisions and, and, and get rebounds and, and stuff like that, like P.J. Tucker is going to play. So uh, get used to that. I, I've been really impressed there. Alex, talk about Tyler Hero rebounding above his size. I mean, I think eight boards is huge in a night like tonight when you need to gang rebound. And then uh, we, we we haven't talked about no ceiling. So uh, what, what did you see from Bam? I mean, Bam, like Brady said tonight, this is a game where he looked a lot more like last season as, as far as being a playmaker. Like he had his most impressive uh, game there and I couldn't agree more with everything he said like I, I I still really like watching that two-man game when that side is cleared out between Bam and Duncan they just really know how to play off each other and it's not the same uh, degree but it reminds me of kind of like Jokic Murray the way that they play off each other because it's mostly handoff stuff and they just have a lot of chemistry with it obviously Murray is a lot more dynamic and do more stuff and Jokic is more dynamic on offense than, than Bam for sure but I'm just saying like they have that chemistry together it's still Really cool to watch. Uh, the PJ thing also hard not to, you know, just fall in love with him as a Heat fan, right? Because it's like he's that exact type of guy that they were missing the past couple of seasons when they tried to go small and switch. And you saw it with Ariza. You saw it with Iguodala. And to some extent, Crowder. It's like those guys, even though they're a little bit taller than Tucker, are not nearly as stocky. There's, it's quite a sizable gap too, right? And those rebounds show up on the stat board sometimes. I mean, the – the, the stat sheet sometimes like they did tonight and sometimes they don't, but he's always boxing out. He's always boxing out and he's always going to be there in the rotation. Sometimes a step slow, right? He's getting up there in age. There's going to be times where he's a step slow on a closeout to a guy like Bogdanovich, for example, but really what he's doing out there is extremely valuable because of what they're trying to do uh, where Bam is constantly, you know, in and out of the pain and, and they're kind of swarming as a switch defense a lot. I just think he he fits perfectly there, and especially on a night like tonight where he hit three threes out of three attempts, and two of them were above the break, right? He looks like an incredible fit next to Bam. We're obviously not going to see that, but this is, I think, PJ's best game in the Heat uniform. Like he's he's a big man. He is he's a big man out there. I don't care that he's six five or six six. He, for all intents and purposes, functionally on the court, he's a big man. Oh, for sure just based off the strength uh, and the way that, I mean, he boxes out like he is, you know, like on some Charles Barkley kind of stuff. But like the other thing with him that I think is really cool is um, like, I guess I thought he was so incompetent offensively that he was like going to give me shades of the Joel Anthony vibes like we're literally like they can't catch the ball and just like put it in the basket like it's he's just being like, used as a roller and yeah and like he, he's got this little floater that he the doesn't floater. make all the time but he, he makes it sometimes about it, by the way. he he works on those before the games we we both saw it at different games uh like him just working on it by himself in pregame and it's so functional too because like instead of always just being planted in the corner he can screen use yeah. that acreage use that stockiness of his to leverage the the defense and then on top of that it's like well if they're gonna play on on the on deadman or bam whoever's down there in the paint i'm just gonna take this floater exactly so kind of and then he's in position down. for offensive rebounds too i i i've been 100%. impressed with pj tucker's offensive game not that he's ever going to be a double digit score for the team uh consistently but i just thought he was way more non-functional than he has turned out to be so far so he's more involved in the offense than he was like during the rockets years for example where he was strictly planted at three-point line in the corners all the time for sure and um and so we're gonna get into kind of looking ahead we're not gonna do much of that because ethan's gonna be back with us and we're gonna unpack the heat looking looking forward but we do want to touch on it before we do going to tell you about uh my favorite sports uh daily fantasy app out there and that's prize picks super easy like 
people sometimes I think when they see the, the prize pick stuff, it's new to them. Uh, they, they may feel like it could be um, something that is intimidating, right? It's so easy. You literally, you log on to the app, you pick your favorite stars, select anything, anywhere between two and five players, regardless of sport, you can mix and match. You choose their over and under, they give you the stats, stat projections, you choose over under, and then you just watch your players win. If you pick correctly, the more money you win, you stack them together. Uh, this is a um, highly acclaimed app. Download the app wherever you get your uh, apps, whether it's the uh, uh, Google Play Store or the Apple, uh, the, the App Store, you can find it there. Uh, you can do power plays. You can do flex plays. There's just so much fun stuff on that app. And when you sign up and deposit, use promo code five F I V E that will instantly double your deposit up to a hundred dollars. Again, that's prizepicks.com or download the app prize picks use promo code five to get your deposit doubled up to a hundred dollars right off the bat. You can play with that money ASAP right when you get it. Anyway, so let's let's put a button on this. We've talked about the Utah Jazz game. We're moving on. They've got one more on the road in Oklahoma City, which sounds like it should be easy. And just because we know how this goes, it's probably not going to be. And then they are um, at home against New Orleans. And then they've got a home and home with Washington. Uh, and that'll kind of get them through the weekend. I'll start with you, Alex, and then Brady, you can put a bow on this one. Um, what are you looking for as they go to Oklahoma City specifically? And then, you know, they're kind of, I felt like this Utah game could kind of salvage the road trip as crazy as that sounds because of, of how undermanned they, they were. Like, what are you looking for as we look ahead to the next week? Um, well, look, just take care of business. I know it's cliche and it's said a lot, when it comes to teams that are considered bad, like the Oklahoma City Thunder, but you got to win that game. And I agree with you as long as they win that game. Like the, the, the Jazz game was a huge win, I think helps make you feel better about the way that they lost those two LA games. Uh, and then if they take care of business with OKC, I'll, I'll, yeah, I would feel a lot better about it just because that's a team that you have no excuse losing against. I don't care if you don't have Jimmy. I understand like they're not they haven't been playing like the worst team in the league. Like some people thought maybe they would like Shea Gildas Alexander is kind of an all-star level player almost pretty much. Uh, and then they've got some good young guys with Josh Giddy, obviously Lou Dort. Dort. You know, they're, they're not a good team, but they're not the one in 11 Pelicans or whatever the Pelicans are now, are now maybe one in 12 after they lost to Brooklyn last night. So um, don't let them sneak up on you. Don't let it be a trap game, Eric. Shout out to, Tony Fiorentino, uh, the Thunder are five and six, man. Like, this is the type of game that and uh, teams, like Heat teams in the past have lost. So don't do it. The one thing that they're not terrible at is defense. They're right there in the middle of the pack. So that's all I can say analysis-wise. Don't let Shea kill you. Just take care of business, man. And, you know, get out of here. Get Finish the road trip without another disaster. Brady, so forever there's been this um... – there, there's been this philosophy that the last game of a long West Coast trip before you're going to get home is always dangerous because everybody's like, yo, we are so close to getting back to the crib, so close to sleeping in my own bed, so close to going to the restaurants I love and being with my family or doing whatever I'm doing. Do you believe that there's any validity in them just wanting to get back to Miami as soon as possible based off this road trip being as cumbersome as it's been one and is OKC a trap game. I mean, I know that they do have that young talent. They're limited in certain ways, but do you think that that's a trap game heading back home? Yeah. For the first point, I don't think you're thinking about getting home in that way when you're one and three on the trip. Like, I feel like that's the thing when you're three and one, you're like, that's the trap game. I feel like, I feel like you're not prepared for it. You're trying to get back home. Maybe. And that just feels the way it usually goes. In this scenario, I think they need to get this one. Like this, I don't want to say that <laughs> too many times before every single game, but it just feels like on this road trip. The reason I think this game tonight was so important for moving forward is not just for the win. I think it's for Jimmy because if they lost this game, Jimmy would probably be, I don't know what his status is going to be in OKC. He'd press, he would have been right. He, he would have been rushing back. Like I feel like, like he would have been pushing it back and maybe he's not ready to return. We don't know. Maybe he will play but it just felt like you do not want to be put in that situation where you're 0 four on the road road trip. And you have Jimmy Butler, your best player rushing back for a game against Oklahoma city who Alex just mentioned is five and six. So I feel like that's the important part. Um, 
So we'll kind of see what happens. I think it could be a trap game, but if Jimmy Butler plays like the questionable tags recently kind of put, make it interesting because of like what it's going to be. But even if without him, this win, I think it's going to cause a lot of momentum more than anything. And I think it'll be interesting. The one other point I want to make about this game as, as we tie this up, is kind of just off topic a little bit, but it's kind of something we see a lot with this depth. Like it's something we see when Tyler moves to the starting lineup and we hear the, the Gabe Vincent talk that they need a backup point guard and he didn't have the greatest offensive night. Like he had some great defensive moments, which need to be mentioned. But I think the interesting thing is, I don't know if backup point guard is the thing we're going to be discussing moving forward as much as front court depth. Uh, looking at tonight, you saw Miami switch from Duncan to Max Schroes to Caleb Martin at the four. Like this isn't front court depth. This is them using their back court depth to, yeah. to it's fill not the front court. sustainable, right, Brady? <laughs> right. So like, it feels like they have a little bit of back court depth that they're using because they have a little bit of size to fill that front court depth. You have Casey Apollo, they're not willing to play in these games. You have Omer Yurtsevin, who they throw in for three minutes, but they seem like they're not trusting at this moment. Udonis Haslam got out there, but it doesn't seem like he's going to be playing extended minutes. It just feels like we're talking so much about the additions of a backup point guard when it feels like it should be the other way. It feels like they need to kind of find something there in the front court so then you can have your guards actually be guards. So I think that's just an interesting thing. Obviously, it's just kind of on blast because you're without Jimmy Butler and you're without Markeith Moore. So maybe when you're healthy, it isn't as loud because you're missing two front court pieces, but it just seems that way right now. Um, but it does seem heading back to OKC, this would be a you know a big one to get. Yeah, for sure. So a um, couple things. Uh, somebody asked me on Twitter if I thought that it would be a viable idea for them to try to package, like let's see, KZ Akpala and another guy to free Gabe Vincent, for instance, to free up a couple roster spots to make the ability to get buyout candidates um, and we're talking way down the line here, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. I think that's absolutely on the table, and I think it's something that they'll explore. I would not even be surprised that they would attach um, small assets of some kind, second round picks if they've got any of them. I got to go check if they've got one in the next 10 years, but um, like they because you're right. Like, yeah, John Wall would be awesome if Gorin gets traded somewhere and bought out. Great. Like bring them all back but the, the the nuts and bolts tell me that those like the, the the lowry's and the jimmies and the bams and the tylers especially now that tyler plays the way that he does they're going to be controlling the ball anyway so like i i agree with you i think that there can be some wing conversations to be had and also front court so more to come there thank you for joining us as we broke down this utah jazz miami heat game uh we will be we will be back next week on a regular schedule uh thank you for joining us Thank you for listening to the Five on the Floor on the Fire Regional Sports Network.